Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon and it is a pleasure to speak with you guys. Uh, this message this evening that I'll be speaking to you is, I don't know if it's going to be quite lengthy, but it's definitely, uh, it's, it's quite challenging to bring. I've been in study on this for quite some time and um, knowing at which angle to bring this to help you to understand is very difficult. So, and it may take several messages to make it clear. I know that often when you speak something, it's easy to be misunderstood, especially if I don't get to sit there and speak with you face to face. It's very difficult to, to understand uh, what I might mean, because if we were face to face, you could ask a question. You know, what do you, what do you, what do you mean by that? But in this case here, it's not as easy to do. And of course, there's many questions that are asked uh, in, the, in, the, in the question boxes, but you keep in mind, besides this video, we get questions or, or, or comments on videos just by the hundreds. And so there are just thousands of comments that come in every day, so it's very difficult to get to all of them. Um, but let me just, uh, we'll start here. I want to start right in Romans 11:25. Um, this is where Paul is speaking about the Jews and the Gentiles as well. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, and to the fullness of Gentiles be come in. Hmm. Interesting. Blindness in part has happened to Israel, and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Um, now, well, who are the Gentiles? And that's, a, that's been a major question among a lot of people, or who are the Gentiles? And uh, I know there's been some people say, well, you know, these are the ten tribes of Israel. They're the lost tribes of Israel. Um, but there's no doubt there's some truth to that. But it's not all truth, but there is some truth to that. Um, because naturally, the, the, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel got scattered to all the world. So yes, they are in every land. They have uh, assimilated into the, into the areas that they have gone to. They have married among the, the Gentiles that are there. And so they have uh, mixed the Jew and Gentiles together, but you're still Jewish, even though you may have, you know, you may have mixed in there. But there is a scripture that is very interesting um, that I wanted to share with you. And if I can only remember which one it is now, because I have them, had it, I thought I had them all laid out here, but I, th I think it's in Genesis. Um, let me, let me just see if I can find this real quick. Uh, Yes, it's Genesis uh, chapter 48 and uh, verse 19 specifically. Now, this, the story that, that we're looking at here is when Joseph, he's come down, um, excuse me, Jacob has come down. Joseph uh, is going to have his children, Ephraim and Manasseh, blessed by his father, Joseph. And when he, when he brings the two boys in there, his father is nearly blind. He can't see. Uh, he's very old and... Uh, when he goes to lay his hands on there, and of course Joseph is positioned him to make sure that his right hand goes on the eldest, which was Manasseh, and his left would go on uh, Ephraim. But as he went to lay his hands on them, he crossed his hands, and he laid his right hand upon Ephraim and his left hand upon Manasseh. And um, when he did, he blessed them. Of course, jo Joseph was kind of angry at first because he's like, Father, he says, you, you, you've you crossed your hands. This is the eldest. This is the youngest. Uh, but he says, the Lord has crossed my hands. And truly, Manasseh will be blessed, but it is his younger brother uh, that will really be, will be really blessed. Uh, now, here's what I want to share with you. Uh, because this scripture got brought to my attention recently, and in fact, my wife even asked me about it. She says, what does this say actually in Hebrew? In English, you read this here, and, I, and I, I don't have King James in front of me, but it's similar to that. It says, and he blessed them that day, saying, be the uh, shall, excuse me, I'm sorry, and his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it, he also shall be a people, 
speaking of Manasseh, and he also shall be great. Howbeit his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. That's interesting, isn't it? A multitude of nations. In fact, if we think back to Abraham, God says to him, you shall be a father of many nations. And of course, we know through the blood of Christ, the Gentile people come in. Now, there's, there's certain scriptures that always stick in my mind uh, uh, when I look at the New Testament, and that is uh, there, there's clearly a Gentile people that Jesus deals with because we see like the woman that comes to him that's a Gentile, and she says, Lord, my daughter is, daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And Jesus said, it's not meat for me to give the children's bread unto dogs. And he calls her, not just her, but her whole race, the Gentile people, dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, but the dogs eat the, uh, the crumbs under the master's table. And then Jesus says, I've never seen such faith, not in Israel, such great faith. And of course, the woman is blessed as a result. Her daughter is made well. And, uh, and, and she finds favor in the sight of Christ, uh, which is a such a truth about the Gentile people that, that really have the ability to believe and that accept and believe Yeshua to be the Messiah. Uh, but here's what's interesting in this right here. Uh, so he says here that Ephraim, uh, excuse me, that uh, yeah, Ephraim, that he, his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Well, my wife asked me today, she says, what does it actually say in Hebrew? So I, just, I said, okay, let me Pull out the Hebrew uh, scriptures and let's see what it says. Okay, he says, and and he says, I know my son, Yadati Gam Hu, I know uh, he also will be a great people, speaking of Manasseh. Igadal, and he also will be great. Literally, I'm just reading, translating it to you literally for Achiv uh, Hakatan, but his brother, the small one or the younger, Hakatan uh, being the smaller, younger, Igadomimenu. See, he will, his son will be greater than he is. Okay, Mimenu. Vezerahu, all right, and his seed, Ichaye Melo Agoim. Literally, it says, and his seed will be the fullness of the Gentiles. And that blew me away. His seed will be the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, a multitude of nations, I can see why they would translate it that way. But, but literally, in Hebrew, uh, malo, malo is actually fullness. It's the way the word malo was translated properly. It's fullness. He's the fullness of the Gentiles. So it really made me think completely different in light of Jesus saying, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Uh, and, and we have another place in the scripture uh, where in Romans eleven twenty five, 25. Uh, and Paul speaking there. Let me pull that one back up. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So, which Gentiles is he speaking about? Because certainly the gospel goes to the Gentiles as well. But in this case here, Ephraim becomes, his seed becomes a multitude of nations, or his seed becomes the fullness of the Gentiles, or they will be the fullness of the Gentiles. Well, obviously what has happened is Ephraim uh, is being a tribe unto himself, and in the sin with the house of Israel, he is scattered into all the world as well. But undoubtedly, Ephraim's children and his descendants would really become a multitude. In fact, another scripture says about the house of Israel that they would be so, that they would become an innumerable, like the sand on the seashore. So you may see, and, and some of this I'm just saying hypothetically, um, and it may be accurate, it may be right with the word of God, but I just put it here as a conjecture for something for you to think about yourself. But we may find more and more 
And one thing that I know the Jewish people have always believed too, is that the Christian people, the ones that we consider to be the Gentile people that love Israel and have a passion for Israel, normally you find out that they are also genetically related to the Jewish people as well. And so that's something uh, that's, that's of an interest, interest to me as well, is that you generally have Jewish blood in you. But what's interesting, though, is to see that this scripture right here is, is clearly, in Genesis, is clearly showing us that the fullness of the Gentiles is actually going to be through Ephraim's descendants. And um, now, could it also be, because there's so many different scriptures, I mean, uh, another one that comes to my mind, and, and, and bear with me because I've got so many things laid out here, is... Jesus says to his apostles, I will make you fishers of men. And uh, we know this to be true. And which is very interesting because if you go to Jeremiah chapter 16, I want to just share with you a little bit what it says here. Jeremiah 16 verse 14, Therefore behold the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands, whether he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land and uh, that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, you will be the, I'll make you fishers of men. Now remember, he did command his, uh, his early apostles, he said, go only into the lost house of Israel. Um, so after, after uh, he says, after I will send for many hunters and they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every hill, out of the holes of the rocks. Um, from, from mine, for mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. See? still remembers their iniquity. The iniquity only comes to an end when? When the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Does this really mean that this is bringing back the ten tribes of Israel? In this case here, the fullness of the Gentiles would be Ephraim's particular tribe because Ephraim has intermarried in amongst the Gentiles and has literally become a multitude of nation, a fullness of the Gentiles. So it's obvious that Ephraim literally mixes in with practically every nation under heaven. And so many believing Christians today may very well have a trace of the Ephraimite, Ephraimite bloodline. Now, when I say this, don't misunderstand, there are still true Gentile believers that have no Jewish blood whatsoever that are saved by the grace of Christ, that have accepted that blood uh, of, of the Lord Jesus. But remember, when you as a Christian believe on the Lord Jesus, you actually are coming into the covenant of Israel. You have to, because why? You believe that you are Israel. You are, because you are now a spiritual Jew, because you're coming in through the covenant of Israel. You're coming into the same olive tree, which that olive tree's root of course, is Christ, but it is still, you're grafted in to the covenant of Israel. That's what brings you in. That's what the whole, even the law of God for the Gentiles, when Israel came out of Egypt, it was a mixed multitude. It wasn't just only Jews. There were also Gentiles among them. But they were Gentiles that had embraced the God of Israel and believed and had accepted their ways. In every case, in every Gentile that has ever joined into the, to the commonwealth of God, they've always had to embrace the covenant of Israel through circumcision, etc. It had to be embraced. And, and I'm not trying to put you under a bondage of law. I'm just telling you what the scripture, how, how it was. Uh, even Joseph, he married Asenath. She was, a, she was an Egyptian girl, a Gentile, 100%. No Jewish blood in her whatsoever. But she came in to the commonwealth of Israel, accepting and believing the same God that Joseph did. So anyway, um, 
He says in verse 18, At first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself, and there are no gods? Therefore, behold, I will... This once caused them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. That is Hashem, God's divine name. Now remember, remember in a message we did not too long ago, I established for you that, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this for the sake of, of my Christian brothers that listen. Um, I know that it's not the correct way to say God's divine name. We say Hashem as Jews, but Yahweh is what you guys normally refer to him as. Yahweh and Yeshua are one and the same. We established this clearly for the simple reason is, as I read to you in the scripture, how that the scripture says that everything that was ever created, was both visible and invisible, was created by Jesus. And nothing, nothing exists that he didn't make. And then we took the scriptures and we looked at in the creation in Genesis and every single place that is created is Yahweh creates, Yahweh creates, Yahweh creates. Well, something's wrong then if the scripture says Yeshua did it and nothing exists except what he did. But remember, there's a difference between the invisible God. See, Yeshua was Yahweh present. He is, he is Yahweh become manifested in a human body. So that's what we have there. Uh, but I, I kind of say that to build you a little platform here. I, I want to take you to Hosea. Okay. But, but I'll tell you what though, before I take you to Hosea, I want to, let me, there was one other one I wanted to share with you in Romans uh, before I go there. And that's why I was bringing this part out about Yahweh because we see so many times that the name of the Lord, the name Yahweh, is really plays a great preeminence at the very end time, in the closing hours of the day. There's, uh, I think it's an Obadiah where it speaks about his name, or no, I'm sorry, Zephaniah, where God's divine name will be restored in the very end. And he'll restore pure language that everyone will be able to call upon his divine name the name of uh, that we say Yahweh. But what we, it sometimes that seems a little confusing because uh, there, there, are many, there are many Trinitarians that, that realize that Jesus of the New Testament is Yahweh of the Old. Uh, and they realize that God is the invisible, you know, the, the invisible Father. Uh, but yet at the same time, he says to one of his apostles, he said, you know, they said, show us the Father. And he says, how long have I been with you and you don't even know me? Why? Because he and his Father are one. Uh, he is the, the expressed image of the invisible God. Uh, that's what Jesus actually is. He is the, in, the expressed image of the invisible God. And at the same time, if we know that God is invisible and Moses wanted to see God, and he said, no man could see my face and live. Well, that's interesting. Then Yahweh then cannot technically be the invisible father if he has a backside for Moses to see. And I remember one time that used to be a little confusing for me. I think to myself, how in the world can that be? But, but it is so. I'm sitting here trying to find a book, a book of Romans and... Let me just do it with a computer. I guess it'd be a little faster for me here. No, I've got I've got to find it here because I've got things marked that I want to share with you. Here we go. Uh, and, and here was the one that, that I wanted to share. And this is in um, Romans chapter 9. Look at verse, let's go to verse 30 down to 33. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, which we know that was Christ. 
As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion, or Sion, Zion, same thing, a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay, now hold that thought right there. Now going down into chapter 10, let me start with you here at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Again, we read that verse. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. You see what I mean? That's how you know that Jesus of the New Testament is Yahweh of the Old. Because he puts the same words there. He shows you that calling upon the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. And he quotes it from the from the uh, from the Tanakh, um, and that's actually found. If you want the verse, that's in Joel two thirty two. Upon whoever calls upon the name of Yahweh Hashem shall be saved. So when you call upon the name of Yeshua, you're literally saying Yahweh's salvation. You're actually saying God's divine name. Because even, even in uh, Jeremiah, I think it's 23 and also Jeremiah 16, his name shall be called Yahweh, our righteousness. And by the way, that is not a compound word. You know, Yeshua is a compound word. It's God's divine name in a compound with the word salvation. Yahweh is salvation. But in, in, in uh, Jeremiah 23, it's not like that. So, I just kind of bring this out because it's kind of interesting, and I wanted to share that with you a little bit. But but let me take you now to Hosea. Um, Hosea says here, The word of the Lord that came uh, unto Hoshea, the son of Bari, in the days of uh, Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, uh, Yehezekiah, kings of Yehuda, in the days of Yoravom, and the son of Yoash, king of Israel. I'll tell you what, I better read that to you guys in King James because I know that can be a little confusing, some of the names that we have here. Um, and also, sometimes the verses fall a little different than what you're used to, and I don't want, I don't want this to be confusing at all. Uh, I'll use Hebrew when it's appropriate and, and applicable to, to help make sense of some things here. But uh, not everything really needs that. Jose, okay. And I don't need to read all of chapter 1 anyway. In fact, let me drop down to... We know that Hosea, God commands him to marry uh, a, a prostitute. And he does, and he takes a, a woman of whoredom, and the children of whoredom, and, and she has three children. She has uh, Jezreel, her son, the first one, uh, Lo-Ruma, Lo uh, which is her uh, first daughter. And by the way, that name literally means... Um, uh, it means, uh, oh gosh, how would you say that there? Um, not not pitied would be, I guess, the best way to translate that, uh, Lo Roma. But the one that's very obvious is the Lo Ami. And uh, when, she, when she has this child as well, Lo Ami, which means literally not my people. So let's look at that real quick here. Uh, let's go to verse 6. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And, and God said unto to him, Call her name lo -Ma, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. In other words, I will not pity the house of Israel. Um, but I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now, when he had weaned Lo, uh, she had weaned Lo Ruma, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured, 
nor numbered. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. I think that this is the fulfillment. I believe this has a lot to do, and there again I say this is a conjecture, of um, Genesis 48. Because in Genesis 48, 19, clearly Ephraim's descendants, it says, Ihaye Melo Hagoim, his descendants will be the fullness of the Gentiles. And I think what happens there is because of that dispersion and that intermarrying and stuff like that, he begins to, the, the, you know, some have retained it. Some, you know, kept that identity. But even, even in the, um, I remember one time looking at the evidence of this uh, on one of the tombs in the, uh, I think, what was it, the Apache Indians in North Carolina there. They found on one of the tombs. It was in, it was in a museum for the longest time. There was this writing on there, but no one ever knew what it was, but it was, it was the Paleo-Hebrew, and it was God's divine name. There's been many other artifacts found among the Cherokee Indians as well, uh, and they believe that the Jews actually migrated there as well. So we know that they went northwards. We know that the, the early apostles were out uh, evangelizing the house of Israel in the beginning. Paul was doing the same. Paul was dealing with both Jews and Gentiles, uh, we know that. So therefore, like I said, I'm, I, I don't like this absolute idea that, well, all the Jewish believers, they're just the house, uh, 10 lost tribes, and they're coming home, and they're all Christians. I, I don't go in that direction. But I do also realize, though, that there's a lot of truth in that as well, though. So we're going to find out that a lot of the Gentile believers, the, in this case here, the fullness of the Gentiles, are going to be descendants of Ephraim. So this is why I think that you see that passion for Israel. Um, and there are a lot of Christians that just probably could really care less about the Jewish people, but it doesn't mean that they don't love the Lord. They do love the Lord. And they, that may be where your Gentile believers are actually, okay, they're just Gentile believers. They don't, they don't have that mix in there. But it's that ones that have that passion for the Jewish people that love them. Why? It's a bondage. You're kindred to them. And so therefore there is, as they say, that kindred spirit. But anyway, let's move a little further there because this is the other thing. A lot of people make the mistake of taking the scripture where it says uh, that, you know, the people that are not his people, like for example, let me take verse 23 in, in chapter two. And I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy uh, upon her that, I, that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people and they shall say thou art my God. A lot of people think that's just the Gentiles. But you just found out God applies that to the house of Israel. See, because in verse 9 of chapter 1, then said God, call his name law me, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. So it, it, it's, it's odd to look at this. Now, I'll show you another one here. Now, this is something that the Lord revealed to me a little while back. I shared it with you on a video uh, some time ago. But let's just move down into chapter 2. Plead with your mother. Verse 2. She is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let, let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of my sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Lest I strip her naked and set her as in the days when she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. That's interesting like there, slay her with thirst. Remember, what does the rock do? That rock Christ Jesus, when he came and his side was pierced, that rock uh, moved the waters of life, the water of life that was meant for us to drink in the beginning. The same thing like when the rock was split in the, in the wilderness journey, it was a type foreshadowing that Christ would be smitten by the elders of Israel. It'd be the Levites that would actually judge him. He would be smitten. His side would be opened, and the waters of life, which represents the Holy Spirit, would or the yeah the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon the people. All right. So he said he would he would like a dry land and slay her with thirst. In other words, she would die not receiving the Spirit. Because why? She didn't believe. 
Watch what else he says. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot, she hath conceived them, hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water and wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns. Do you, not, do you realize that that is actually a prophecy of Christ? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And God literally was taken for the Jewish, Jewish people and showing them that the way, the way back to him, the way back to get the waters of life, to be able to receive the eternal life that Adam and Eve had, would be through Christ. It would be through the one that is hedged up with thorns. And that's exactly what he had on his head. He had a crown of thorns. I, I want to share with you another scripture if I can find it. Bear with me just one minute here. Now this was, this was another beautiful revelation that the Lord had shared with me a little while back as well that I brought to you in another message. Uh, and that is in the book of Joshua, chapter 23, verse 13. Joshua says here, he says, um, let me back up to verse 11. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Else, if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you. Um, hang on. Know certainly that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. Now, what did Israel do when the when the Greeks came in, they, they invited the Greeks in. The next thing they know, the Romans came in. When, when, when Jesus was here, Yeshua, the Romans were here, and they had overtaken them. And God said he would no longer drive them out. Is that right? We remember that, all right? So what did he say here? These nations, he will not no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. He was prophesying of the very events of Christ's death and that would happen until they would be driven off the land. And exactly, that's exactly what happened to Yeshua. See, there'd be snares and traps and he was scourges and he was trapped. He was trapped into it. He was lying to see. Of course, he knew it. He knew what was going on. And scourges in your sides. They beat him with scourges, whips. Okay, and what else does it say? And thorns in your eyes. Because when they drove that crown of thorn on him, it went right into his eyes. And they were, God was giving them the prophecy to look for until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. And behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth, and, and you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing hath failed, and all good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you all are come to pass uh, unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. And Joshua was prophesying of what would happen to Israel in the future. And again, so remember, he hedges up their way with thorns. The way, Christ is the way to the tree of life. God says in, the, in Genesis, I will, I will guard that way of the tree of life or preserve the way of the tree of life. In other words, the road to get back to the tree of life is preserved. And when Christ comes, he knows they want to know how to get back to the tree of life. And he says, I am that way. I am the truth and I am the life. The, because it was Eitz Chaim. Okay, if he says, I am the life, he is claiming to be the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. He is the way. In other words, I, the way you're going to get there is to go through me. And that way was hedged up with thorns. They put a crown of thorns on him. See, God's given us prophecies to the Jewish people. This is not just, I'm beginning more and more to realize why all the Gentile brothers and sisters that listen to these messages are listening. You're listening, why? Because you must, there must be something to do with Ephraim in your bloodlines. You know? And, and I'm not trying to create a doctrine out of that. I'm just, I'm just simply saying it's really interesting because I have no idea that, that you know, Genesis 48 literally says, See? 
as a rule, okay, the, the seed, the seed will be the fullness of the Gentiles. And they go into every nation. That was just the tribe of Ephraim. Of course, we know he scattered all ten tribes, but Ephraim is applied specifically with intermingling with the nations. And he literally says that he becomes the fullness of the Gentiles because he gets so intermingled with it through the marriages that he does. All right, so anyway, uh, I, I just had to share that with you, though, because that is so beautiful. Jeremiah 23, 13 now know for certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you, which they did, 70 A.D., just 40 years after, not even 40 years later, they were totally driven out of the land. All right, so we, we go back and we see uh, in Hosea these, these promises here. But he says, and uh, let, let, let me let me back up a little bit to uh, Hosea chapter two and verse fourteen. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort comfortably unto her, and I will give her vineyards from thence and valley of the core and a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and in the day uh, when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And shall it be that, uh, be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi. Now that's important. She will, that thou shalt call me Ishi. Ishi is my husband. You have to understand, in Hebrew, God called Adam. Let me just see if I can show you this here. Called him Ish. That name right there, Ish. Now, the middle letter, the Yod, in there, is for God's divine name. The Aleph and the Sheen, uh, remember it's right to left in Hebrew, is the word fire, the fire of Yahweh. See? Now, we say in modern Hebrew, Baal is a husband. Bali is my husband. That's literally in Hebrew today. But God said, you're not going to call him anymore. Because watch what he says. I didn't finish the, the quote there. And shall call me no more Bali. Because Bali is, literally means my husband in modern Hebrew. But he says, you shall call me Ishi. Why Ishi? Because the fire of God, the fire of Hashem was what dwelt in Adam and Eve. And they were married unto God. See, because he was Ishi. And the, the, the woman, she is um, Aleph, Sheen, Hey. See, that's the way her name is spelled. And that last letter in there, the Hey, is the second letter to God's divine name. I'll, whoop, I'll circle that for you. I oh, got that wrong. Let me, I just want to share this with you here. And when you take the Yod and the Hey, the, the middle letter of Adam's name and the last letter in her name, you take them both out, you have Yah, which is God's divine, beginning of his divine name. And we actually can, we say Yah as well, for saying for God. Now, and so that's where it is. But what was it? It was the Aleph Sheen, the Aleph Sheen, which is the fire. That's the fire of God, the Aleph Sheen. And, but the compound is, it's God's life in them. It is the eighth Chaim, the tree of life. That's what he breathed. When he says, Ipak ba'av nishma Chaim, he said he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, but is in the plural form. Why? Because Adam and Eve both were in the same body at that time. That's why you never see God breathes into Eve's nostrils later, because she was already coming out filled with the Holy Spirit. She had it already. So, we go back. He said, you won't call me any more Bali, you'll call me Ishi, my husband. Because why? She's filled with the Spirit of God. That's why. That's when that happens. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their, by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the, with the beast of the field and with the fowls of the heaven, with the creeping things in the ground. And I will break the bow of the sword and the battle of the earth, and I will make them lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even 
and betrothed thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Wow. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which are not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. It's the house of Israel. Isn't that interesting? God bless you. Shalom. And pray for us. We do need it. Thank you so much.